We're interested in what uh, regulates the development of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And this is one of the types of leukemia that uh, affects uh, primarily children and also young adults. We were interested in finding out um, if one of the genes that uh, has recently been found to be upregulated in this type of disease might be important in the pathogenesis uh, causing this disease. Well, fortunately, um, children don't get cancer often. Uh, but when they do, they typically do get lymphoblastic uh, lymphoma or leukemia, which are sort of continua in this, this type of uh, disease. And I would say that across the entire country, there may be really about 5,000 or so uh, children with, uh, with lymphoblastic lymphoma. Uh, a little bit um, less than half of those are the T-cell variety. The treatment now for leukemia uh, is extremely intensive, especially for the T-cell subtype that I mentioned. Um, children uh, receive induction chemotherapy, which is intravenous medicines uh, and oral medicines uh, over initial four-week course to try to get them into a remission. After that, um, actually the intensity of the chemotherapy steps up and uh, children need to be in the hospital getting a lot of this chemotherapy. Um, overall, the entire course takes on average about three years uh, of pretty intensive treatments. Part of that, a lot of that time they can be at home, go to school, that sort of thing. But during this time, there are, there's a high possibility, probability of um, serious toxicities, such as infections, damage to various organs. The other thing that is, is a big problem in the treatment of T-cell leukemia is that uh, many of these patients need to have cranial radiation to protect them from relapsing in the brain. Um, we know that radiation is good for preventing leukemia to, uh, occurring in the brain, but it also can have long-term effects in terms of uh, decreasing intelligence and increasing the risk for brain tumors. We actually did um, two types of experiments. Um, two of the sets of the first type were done in mouse models. Um, we also did some of the experiments in human leukemia cells, and so we've sort of done the first two phases and hope, you know, ultimately to lead to uh, relevant treatment for, uh, for the clinic. The studies that we did were done with two different um, types of mouse strains that get leukemia. One is a spontaneous mouse strain that, that, that gets it just de novo. The other is where we manipulate the bone marrow of the mice in the test tubes, in culture, put it into new mice following a bone marrow transplant, and these mice then develop T-cell leukemia. And what we found is that um, this gene that we studied called HRB is uh, essential for the efficient development of leukemia. Uh, in, in addition, we identified a direct connection between a known gene that's involved in T-cell leukemia called NOTCH and the high uh, level expression of HRB. And so what we think is that um, NOTCH, which is known now to be mutated in more than half of humans with T-cell leukemia, it's known to upregulate many different genes, but in particular we think that it upregulates this HRB gene to allow the leukemia cells to survive and grow when they ordinarily would, would probably die during development. And we showed that to be the case not only in the mouse leukemia models, but also, as I say, in some of the human leukemia cell lines that, that we tested in vitro. The other thing that comes out of this, um, in addition to really nailing down the, um, the likelihood, the potential for HRB as a molecular target for therapy in the future. It also revealed, I think, for the first time in notch-dependent T-cell leukemia, uh, an important role for iron. And, uh, you know, humans all need iron. We eat iron and, and absorb it from our, from our gut in order to support development of the blood, the red blood cells. Um, However, rapidly dividing cells that also are not red blood cells need a lot of iron to grow, and that's actually why your body tends to naturally downregulate or suppress the availability of iron in your bloodstream. So it's interesting, if you have a chronic infection or if you have a longstanding cancer, your body will spontaneously decrease the amount of iron in the blood to limit the ability of bacteria to grow, and we think the ability of tumors to grow as well. 
The purpose then, we think, of this HRB upregulation is to offset that effect and to increase the ability of the tumor cells to eat up iron and allow them to grow because they need that to, to build parts of their, their daughter cells. So I think that um, in addition to identifying HRB as a molecular target, it also reinforces the idea that if we can perhaps directly manipulate the availability of iron in these patients with leukemia, we may um, favorably uh, affect the, the disease. And the, the concept then comes out of this that if by restricting iron we can make the leukemia cells more likely to die, then perhaps we could scale back these toxic chemotherapies and use less of those, maybe get away with less radiation, that sort of thing. Next, we want to um, specifically test that hypothesis, e exactly that. We want to ask whether limiting the iron in, uh, again, we'll start with mouse models, but we want to ask if we can limit the iron availability to the leukemia cells in several different ways by using different drugs that we already have available, can we then um, use lower doses of chemotherapy in mice to cure them of their disease, that sort of thing. The other thing we want to do is to begin to search for small molecule inhibitors of HRB, and these could then provide the new drugs uh, that might in the future uh, be useful for this uh, type of leukemia. I think we've been uh, very fortunate in the entire field of pediatric oncology in the whole country and also here at Mayo Clinic. The, uh, the children that we have and their parents are, have been extremely willing to um, involve themselves in the clinical research trials that are going on here. And I, I think that overall perhaps 80 percent of patients in the pediatric age group participate in clinical trials. And of course, there's no requirement to do that, but I think that that may be one of the reasons that the overall outcome in childhood cancer is so much significantly better than in adults. Um, and through the use of cooperative clinical trials, um, the cure rates have been improving every year. And so I think that a message to patients and, and families of patients would be to not be discouraged. M many of these diseases are very curable. And I think that with time, the cures will continue to get better every time. And it really will, in a large part, depend on their willingness to continue to participate in these sorts of clinical trials. My message to physicians is, um, is not at the current time that we should limit iron, as I said. But I think it, this does shed light on the idea that iron could play a critical role in lymphoblastic leukemia. And for reasons that, that I won't go into now, we think it may also be true for other types of lymphoblastic leukemia, not just the T-cell type. And I think that um, in the future, it would be very valuable to, at the very least, keep track of the transfusions that we give to patients, note those patients who get a lot versus those that don't, and see if it does correlate with outcome, and also to consider um, whether we need to transfuse as much as we do. There's another intervention that we can consider doing in the future, which would be to give these iron chelating drugs in the context of a transfusion. We do that already routinely for patients who are at high risk for iron overload, such as thalassemia or other hemoglobinopathies. And whenever they get transfused, we give an iron chelator, such as Desferol. This may be something that we want to do in uh, patients with leukemia in the future, so we should consider that.